Now, this is the first day of the uh, chapter, and I, I need to tell you about what we're going to be covering here that is really not on the AP exam. Most of what I'm going to be doing is um, in organic chemistry is not on the AP. The AP covers about, the amount that they have on there, you can cover about a week and a half. I'm going to take about three months to do the organic. And I actually have more than I do after the AP is over. Some of this stuff is on there, but uh, most of it's not. Now, I used to, I fought turning chem to into AP for that reason. Organic is very important to you guys. You don't realize it right now, but if you want to be a pharmacist, you want to be a doctor, you're going to take organic. You want to be, even, even depending on nursing and um, physical therapy, some programs also require organic as well. All right, so you're going to have to take organic. It is considered the weed out class. Hold on, I get more of these. The weed out class of um, wait, there's one more. Uh, this one here. Of 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 uh, any of those programs, um, and sit anywhere. It's okay, sit anywhere. Um, again, these are not going to be written in stone, and this first couple of days are crazy. Whenever you get, I'll get your seating charts on you know next week sometime. Uh, so. I really think this is important to you. I think it's more important than the AP, to be honest with you. I used to do half the year on organic. I now have cut it back quite a bit so I can cover the AP stuff. But I think the, chem, the organic is more important. And we're going to have to learn how to draw and name compounds as complex. Well, probably not as complex as that one, but some very, very complex compounds. And the crazy part about organic is it is really not at all like Chem 1. It's very different. It's like a whole different language. And you'll see that as we go along. But I have to start, unfortunately, I have to start with uh, some review. And in this case, the review of the organic, and you have the papers here, it's going to help you a little bit. The review of the stuff from Chem 1 here that I'm going to be doing in a, in a few minutes will be a lot easier for those of you who had me last year and not so easy for those of you who had Chem two years ago or, or even three in some cases. So you may have a harder time. Uh, but either way, I will review with you that stuff. Let's start off, though, with some basic things. Why do we study organic chemistry? What is the point? Uh, well, first of all, what, I asked this in the air class. I was surprised. Some people didn't know. What is the study of organic? What is the study? Hmm. Again, I'm surprised. What does organic chemistry mean? Come on. Somebody. Living. What are you studying in organic chemistry? Living. Ah, good. Wrong answer. Good wrong answer. I like wrong answers. Living things. Well, that would be biochemistry or biology. We'd be studying living things. Or the chemistry of living things would be biochemistry. No. Uh, although living things are made of this particular element. Exactly. We're studying carbon. It's a study of carbon compounds. Now, some of you might have a problem with that. It's like, why? Why would I want to study just carbon compounds? Carbon and its compounds. What's the point of that? I bet some of you can give me some reasons why. I got some good answers in the last class, and you will too. What's a reason why I might want to study carbon and carbon compounds? Anyone. It's not in everything. You can't say it's in everything. It makes up many Be more specific. Why? What, what specific things does it make up? Everything living or once was living. Okay, li yeah, living things. We are living. <laughs> so we would obviously be interested in carbon compounds because we are a carbon compound. Or we're made up of carbon compounds. So that's good. That would be one good reason. Somebody said in the other class, anybody have another one for that? Somebody said in the other class, well, because of fossil fuels. You know, that's a big thing in the news. And, and, and you know, Fossil fuels are made of carbon compounds, and that's absolutely true. Uh, natural gas, coal, uh, oil, all that stuff. All right, so that's all true, too. Now... Um, but that's not why. That's not, let's put it this way, that is partly why, certainly. But it's not the only reason why. As a matter of fact, if none of that was true, if we were not made of carbon, there would still have to be an entire branch of chemistry devoted to carbon compounds, organic chemistry. You know why? Because there are more carbon compounds than there are of all the other compounds of all the other elements combined together. Now, you have to be careful. I am not saying there are more carbon compounds than there are compounds of potassium or hydrogen or lithium. I'm saying there are more compounds of carbon than there are of potassium, hydrogen, lithium, and every other guy combined together, and it's not even close. And it's not even close. Carbon is unique. Most guys... I hope this works today because it did not work in here. That was another problem I had. 
I couldn't get the, uh, ah, it's working good. Most elements, okay, if I talk about salt, you all can tell me the formula for salt, right? What's salt? NaCl. If I ask you the formula for water, you can tell me the formula for water. What is it? H2O. So whenever H combines with O, you pretty much get H2O. Not always. There's one other, uh, there's an exception. There's, it could be H2O2. That's hydrogen peroxide. But that's about it. Salt, NaCl. Most compounds are like that. If you say what the two elements are, I did this last year a lot of times. You look up the elements, figure out octet rule, place the periodic table, charge here, charge there, balance them out. There's your formula. And that's the only formula. So you might think to yourself, well, there might be one or two different forms. If I combine carbon and hydrogen together, carbon and hydrogen, you don't have to write it down. Carbon and hydrogen combined together. Well, what's that going to be? Well, you know say, well, I'll tell you that this is one of the simplest organic compounds, one of the simplest uh, hydrocarbons, CH4. Problem. There can also be C2H6, C3H8, C4H what? 10. You see the pattern? And that means that I can have chains of carbon compounds. You see? Carbon, 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 and then other hydrogens coming off of them. And it's worse than that. I could have CH4 with mean, this pattern that you see here, which CH4 drawn would look like, well, that's pretty horrible, but uh, <laughs> this is obviously not very well, uh, uh, not very well uh, aligned. But CH4, could al I could also have C2H, I said 6, I could have C2H4. I could have C2H2. And all of them have different names. They all have a different name and a different structure and a different formula for every, and different properties. Every one of these guys. That's why. Not only can I grow big, long chains of these guys. Oh, and they can form rings, too. They can combine together into a ring. Into rings of different lengths, too. Six, five. It's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. So the number of carbon compounds dwarfs everybody else in the periodic table. Just the carbon combining with hydrogen. Oh, and one last thing. If that's not bad enough, uh, basically throw in there the fact that carbon combines with most of those guys. It combines with oxygen and fluorine and chlorine and bromine and, and a whole bunch of other elements as well. Uh, it combines in weird ways. Nitrogen it combines in crazy ways, and it combines with a lot of other elements in the periodic table. So unlike some people, like for example, you wouldn't expect sodium to combine chemically with potassium. Sodium wants to lose an electron, potassium wants to lose an electron. They're not going to get together, right? Well, carbon's right in the middle, so he tends to get together with just about anybody that'll have them, you know? And that's another reason why there are so many carbon compounds, right? Okay, good enough. Well, that's my little intro. That's always been the intro to my organic uh, chapter. However, chapters, many chapters. Now I've redone these first three pages. These first three pages are totally different than what if you were to look at the people who did this class last year. Because I've decided that I need to talk about, I have to first review a little bit with you, uh, the bonding in carbon. All right? Because this is one of the few things that actually would be on the AP exam. How the kinds of bonds you're, you would be have to recognize on an AP test and what they would, uh, you know, can you identify them? And can you tell me the properties of them and how they're formed? I'm not saying there's going to be a lot of it on the test. However, it is something that I always skip because it's confusing. And there's a lot here to it. It's not easily explained. I can't just do it in one quick period. I'm going to do as much as I can in this period, pretty much as quickly as I can, because I'm hoping for an uninterrupted period, unlike I had this morning. And I want to be able to post this one on YouTube so you can actually, people were absent. There were a lot of people were out first period because of those two meetings. Some missed the first half, some missed the second half. So, uh, but the point is, it's a very long thing to cover, and I probably won't get through all of it today. I'll have to finish it tomorrow. And then we'll have to practice it. You're going to need practice on this because it isn't easy. Okay? A little bit of a review here with you. Remember this? Don't cut. This isn't even on your papers. This is a little bit of a review from Chem 1. All right? Um, remember SP, what was the next one? SPD. And F, right? Remember those, those three, the orbital shapes? Those are the orbital shapes. You remember what an orbital is? The electrons going around the nucleus, you know, and that's their probability of being found, where they are that electron cloud 
probability. It's not a circle, like I told you that. All right, it's a cloud. It's a probability where you might find the electron more likely to find it. And in the case of the s orbital, which is the most stable one, that shape was S-shaped. I never made you memorize those, okay? But you probably remember seeing that S-shape, and you probably remember seeing, can you see this, like, dumbbell, two balloon shape? You remember seeing those. I didn't make you memorize D. You did remember seeing those two, and those are the two you kind of have to know for today. So I'm kind of reviewing this with you a little bit. Remember how the P could be in the X-axis, the Y-axis, and even the Z-axis? And I went over that. This is, like, so long ago for some of you, because some of you didn't have it last year. You had it two years ago. So I understand that. That's why I'm reviewing it a little bit with you, all right? Well, <laughs> carbon does some really, really funky things with these S and P orbitals. We'll talk about that in a minute, but you got to let me do a little bit more review. Something I did not cover in Chem 1, and I will cover this year. When these guys bond, what happens? What happens when a covalent bond happens? What happens to electrons? What, are they, what happens to them? Electrons from one guy and the other guy. They are what? And covalent. They're shared, right. They're shared, remember? Ionic, they're transferred. But in covalent, they're shared. Remember that? Well, that's all I said last year. We did, you know, polarity and non-polar and polar and uh, electronegativity differences. But I didn't really talk about what those shared bonds look like and what they were called. This is what they were called. This is something I will cover this year in Chem 1, but I did not cover last year in Chem 1. They are called sigma or pi bonds. So write this down. The sigma bonds, first of all. Sigma bonds are covalent bonds formed by sharing electrons in a manner in which they head-to-head -head overlapping of those orbital shapes. Head-to-head, -head, I'll explain in a minute. This is going to get a little confusing to you, okay? But try to stick with me. I am going to go pretty quickly today, but we will have time. We have a double period tomorrow. It won't be as rushed. I have a worksheet for you to practice it, and I will answer questions and probably show you some more stuff for sure. Just try to get through this with me if you can. That's what a sigma bond is. So basically, and you have a picture of those there. I'm going to go over them on the board here. I just want to give you the notes first. Sigma bonds are the strongest of the covalent bonds, and they allow free rotation. Simplest example of a sigma bond would be a guy like this. Say I had hydrogen, the, the hydrogen molecule. Okay, hydrogen, two H's combined together in a diatomic way. All right, so here's an S, because if you think about hydrogen, right, if we were to write hydrogen out, what's the meaning just done? Uh, well, I can't really go back one. It's going to turn it on again. Um, but I'll write hydrogen out. Hydrogen is basically 1s1, right? And then oh, I add to that another guy who's 1s1. Okay, so there's an s orbital and an s orbital. They overlap, where they overlap, head to head. Okay, I would make the model like this, and I would probably draw the sigma bond like that. Now, we didn't do that last year. I will be doing that with them this year, knowing now that I'm going to have to cover that partly for AP and partly just so you can understand these bonds in organic. Okay? But I didn't in the past. But that shouldn't be too hard to understand, right? Now, the crazy part, let me tell you, point out some of your flaws right away. You might say to yourself, well, sigma has to be two S's. No. It actually could be an S and a P. As long as they overlap, one electron here, one electron there, overlap head to head, they will allow free rotations. So S and a P, for example, would be the case if I took a hydrogen and I combined him with a fluorine. Think, how would you have ended fluorine? Wouldn't fluorine have ended like this? One, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Oh, I gotta go all the way back to this. All right. Okay. Fluorine would have ended like this, right? You would have had 1s2, 2s2, 2p5. Everybody? No, I mean, I don't think I'm saying anything new here. And, you know, he wants to have one more electron for there, so he's going to have this p orbital, which looks like that, with only one electron in it. He'll want to share that. He'll want to get a pair there. He'll want to get an octet. If he combines with the hydrogen, which has only a 1s, right, he's going to share with that one guy there, and that's what that would look like, right? Sigma bond as well. Now, 
the, what's confusing about this, so you can be confused, uh, my next guy, I'm going to say in a second, is going to be called the pi bond. And pi bonds do involve p orbitals. Sigma bonds can also involve p orbitals. They're not exclusive, okay? As long as it's head-to-head -head sharing. You can even have two p's. For example, what if, what, doesn't fluorine form a diatom? Isn't fluorine F2? Wouldn't he be sharing a p orbital like that? Exactly. All right, good enough. So, so far so good. I know you're a little like, okay, I'm waiting for the really hard stuff, but this is kind of just, you know, not that bad. Uh, let's see. The sigma bonds are these head-to-head -head overlapping orbitals. Pi bonds, they're not like that. They're a little bit uglier. Take a look at this guy. The pi bond here happens between two p orbitals, okay? And again, here's another mistake. This is not one pi bond, and this is another pi bond. The p orbital is this whole thing. And this p orbital is this whole thing. The pi bond is both of them, where they're sharing those electrons between them. And it's ugly. Whereas the sigma bond, which is shown here, allows free rotation. Right? So for example, if I have a sigma bond between two carbon atoms, all right, like this, I can rotate them. They're constantly rotating around all the time. But if I have a pi bond, in, in addition to that, there's a sigma between here, which you can't see, and the pi bond, as it shows with this, I can't rotate it, okay? You actually have this above and below the axis, and you can't rotate it. It's not, so, there's some different properties to the pi bond. It involves p orbitals or d orbitals. Don't worry, I'm not going to go over those. I'm not going to talk about them. D orbitals. They're way too ugly. Uh, but it does involve p or d orbitals. They are covalent bonds as well. They're sharing, but they're sharing above and below this axis, so it prevents um, rotation, this lateral overlapping, and it is a weaker bond than the sigma bond. Now, I'm not even half done with this crazy stuff, and some of you are already thinking, when can I get down the guidance and drop this, because this is getting crazy. Again, I don't want you to think organics like this. This is the one concept in this chapter that is this crazy and relies on so much prior Chem 1 stuff. It is not typical of the rest of this chapter, or even the rest of organic. I don't want you to think it is. Don't go running down there to try to drop the class immediately. Get through this. I'll help you with it. It'll take a couple days. This is new to me. This is new to me, people. You have to realize that. I used to gloss over this for the very reason that it is tough. Now, I can't do that anymore with it since it's AP. I have to teach this stuff to you. Does that mean I'm going to teach it in such a way and ask questions in such a way like the AP does that you're all going to fail the class and you're, you know, you know the AP? Uh, we took that class over the summer this year. 7% out of nationwide got a 5 on the AP exam. 7%. That was the lowest except for Physics 1, which was the first year of Physics 1. And most people like Schrader's classes. We're teaching 70-some kids in single periods, and it's no wonder they didn't do it. It's like trying to cover every, all that information. Chem, AP Chem is one of the hardest, the hardest uh, uh, AP exam you're going to take. All right, so I have to teach this to you. I'm going to do the best I can, but don't panic yet. Panic in a couple of weeks when you don't, still don't understand it, but don't panic yet. All right, so the P orbitals overlapping forms, and this whole thing is one pi bond. Okay? Now, Let's talk about double versus triple bonds. Actually, hold on a second. I think I, I kind of came to the conclusion while I was teaching this in the other class that I might want to do this slide first. So I want you to skip to this. I, here, this is my first year doing this. So I want you to skip to where it says hybridization in your notes right there. Okay? You're going to be filling these in. And I'll try to, I think I'm going to try at least doing it this way first. And see if it works, and then come back to that other slide. All right. Well, th that was a review of Chem One stuff. St it should be a re next year when I'm teaching this. That'll be a review because I'll have taught it when I cover orbitals to them. I'll have taught sigma and pi. I'll have done some problems with it. They you won't. They won't be looking at me like you're looking at me with this. What's he talking about? Okay. Now here comes the new stuff. Carbon does something funkier than that. Carbon doesn't just take S and P orbitals and combine them together in different ways with a, with a 
a, a sigma bond or a pi bond. It actually meshes them together. It actually combines s and p orbitals together into a brand new shape. A brand new shape. Multiple brand new shapes. I told you this gets crazy. It's going to take work. So copy all that down, and then I'll show you with some examples of how it does this and why it does this. Okay? All right. Listen. What happens is, for carbon, for reasons I will explain in a few seconds, carbon's not happy having a separate S and separate P orbitals. Turns out it's more stable if it were to jam these guys, mesh these guys together into a brand new orbital, which we would call an SP hybrid orbital. Look at the shape. It's not a sphere anymore, but it's not this either. It's kind of like an elongated balloon where I had two kind of even balloons, right? Now, that's what it does when it does this hybridization. Let me try to explain to you a little bit why it does it. If you were to have drawn carbon last year, would you not agree that you would have all driven, drawn that, correct? Everybody look good today? Cop copy that down. The only difference is I used to put my 1s's above and the arrows below. I mean, that means nothing. People do it one way, people do it the other way. It's not a big deal. So copy that down. Everybody agrees the carbon has six electrons. They're going to go in the 1s, then in the 2s, and then there'll be two left over to go into the three, P, uh, the three orbitals for the p, but only two of them get electrons. Now, something strikes us right away with that. I've said before how filled and half-filled things are actually tend to be more stable, right? Something like this is not very happy. I'm not very happy with this. It's got this blank orbital here and only half-filled ones there. The sublevel isn't half-filled. It's just not happy. Turns out what happens is these, these orbitals are such a similar energy to themselves that it's actually better for it. And this is kind of say during the process of hybridization. What it does is kind of moves one of these guys up or promotes one of these electrons to the P. And it doesn't stay like that. Okay, but think of it doing that, even though it's not technically exactly what's going on. But think of it kind of giving itself all, you know, trying to even things out. Things are going to be more stable that way. Okay? And then not having a separate half filled 2s or a separate, three separate half-filled 2p orbitals, but rather meshing them together into this sp hybrid orbital like this. Oh, and by the way, I couldn't find the same graphic as this, so it's, it's a little bit, and this should say a 2. This should say 1s2. It's just missing the 2 over there. So it's actually 1s2. But all of these guys, this is the key here, they're sp3 identical orbitals. Identical. You don't have three half-filled p's and one half-filled s. You've managed, somehow, carbon jams them all together and makes what's called an sp3 hybrid. Okay? Write all that down. And remember, don't forget the 2 above the 1s. That should say 1s2. I just forgot it. So carbon is different. And because of its differences, we have a larger variety of things that can happen with carbon than would happen with a normal chemical bond. No, two guys just getting together, getting down, getting funky. What time is this over? 103? Good. We're doing all right in time. We're okay. Now, uh, because I changed these around, I'm going to have to change the next slide. So, uh, So, you have this one. You look for this page on your notes. Here's what I'm saying happens. You watching this? It's crazy. An S orbital combines with three P orbitals, as I just saw with the arrows and blanks thing. Now, here are the actual pictures, and forms four SP3 orbitals. Look at those shapes. Look at them. See? 
they're like elongated balloons instead of just being a separate sphere and a separate uh, dumbbell. What you get from that is this shape. It's called, no surprise, a tetrahedron. That's a tetrahedron. Okay? The angles between these bonds are all 109.5, and I'm going to write that down in a little bit. But that's called an sp3 hybrid, and it exists in single bonds for carbon. But it turns out carbon can form double bonds, triple bonds, that I'm going to list for you here in a second. Because carbon, you, you all wrote that down, right? Because not only the energy level, the energies of these orbitals are so similar, and sometimes it just works out it's advantageous for the way it joins, for S to just join with two of the p orbitals. Take a look at this. Y'all see this? It's kind of like I notice this light on your papers, isn't it? Like kind of got washed out. So watch here so you can see it. One S and only two of the p orbitals now combine. See? One, two, three, one, two, three. And it leaves one of the P's alone. Okay? That's called an S. P2 hybrid, sp2 hybrid. It's hybridizing two of the p's and one s together, and it leaves one of the p's alone. How does that look? Well, it kind of looks like this. This is sp2 hybrids. The carbon here is bound to how many different things? One, two, three. Three things, okay? For this guy, the carbon was bound to how many things? sp3 hybrids are bound to four things. You see? SP2 hybrids, what happens here is you've got three SP2 hybrid orbitals that it's able to form a bond in. And it also has a remaining P orbital, okay, that it didn't do that with. Okay, it's just basically left that one alone. And this exists in double bonds. That P orbital is used to make that double bond because you know where that P orbital is? You can't see it here. But that P orbital is like a donut above and below this sigma bond that's here. A double bond is a sigma and a pi bond together. That's what a double bond is. This is an sp3, sp3, and sp3 coming out here with a sigma bond between it. And I'll show you this better with a picture in a second you have on there. And then the pi bonds that are sharing above and below are there. Now, just write this last one down. I don't have a picture of it, but the sp1 hybrid would obviously be 1s and 1p, leaving two other p's. And I'll get to that at the end of this class. And that's where you get a triple bond. Now the way I draw those, by the way, you know, if I'm drawing organic compounds, single bonds, I could just draw, you know, like this. There's an H, oh, it's coming off the wrong. H coming off here, H coming off there. I just draw single bonds as a dash, like I always did. A double bond, and you did see some double bonds. When we went into oxygen, remember he had a double bond for electron dot Lewis structures? A double bond would be two there. And then I would have two other guys coming off like this. There is a, and the triple bond would look like this. You don't have to draw this, I'm just showing you. An H there, an H there. There is a common denominator between all these for carbon. It hasn't changed. You wonder how I was able to skip going over into this much detail in the past. That's when I have to do it now. Well, I don't have to do it now, but I was able to skip it because there is a common denominator between this. How many lines, how many bonds can carbon form and will form every single time? Four. Four. Regardless of whether it's bound to three other things or four other things or two other things, there's always going to be one, two, three, four bonds coming off of carbon. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Always going to be four. That's going to be the common denominator. The question is, is it sp3 hybrid, sp2 hybrid, or sp1? And that's going to take some practice and some uh, uh, you know, more explanation, which I'm going to get to right now. Double and triple. Let's talk about those double and triple bonds. Okay. Now you have to go back. We are doing this out of order. I just decided this this morning, as everything was kind of going, I realized, geez, they're really out of uh, sync here. They're not really getting what I'm talking about with double and triple bonds. Well, a double and triple bond is formed by combining sigma and pi bonds together in different amounts. Of them. And I'm going to illustrate for you what each one of them is. I have just barely enough time. We should get this in by 103. 
and I'll have managed to jam all of this into one period, and that's pretty darn good, considering this morning I couldn't do it in two. <laughs> I'm not kidding. But that's because of all the interruptions. All right, starting with a double bond. A double bond consists of one sigma and one pi bond. I will show you pictures of these each. In, they are on your papers. But right now, just write the, the notes down. We're just going to get through the notes first. One sigma and one pi bond. Sigma bonds, again, being head-to-head, -head free rotation overlap, such as you would have in a case like this. Okay, like this. Okay, they, this is a sigma bond. So is this a sigma bond. So is this. These are all sigma bonds. They can all rotate in any direction. Okay, 360 degrees. The double bond is going to be, I'm sorry, uh, that's a sigma bond. The double bond, of course, is going to be uh, have both. There's a sigma bond between here, and there's a pi bond above and below. So a single bond, free rotation. This guy, no. Double bonds, these guys are shorter and stronger than the single bonds, but they also don't allow free rotation, as I think I said in the previous slide. Right? I know I have it written down there. Triple bonds contain one sigma and two pi bonds. Again, when we get to the pictures, it'll make a little bit more sense when I show you that. And we call those guys sp1 hybrids, because they have only hybridized one s and one p. And they've left two other P's to form that pi, those other two pi bonds. So it's hard to show it with these, but it would be like having three of these guys around it. And I'll show you that in a little bit. These guys are the shortest and the strongest bonds. Now, that brings up another common misconception. Okay? Let me explain the common misconception involved with, with strengths of these bonds. If you were to look back at the very first notes I gave you about sigma versus pi, I said sigma was the strongest bond, and I said pi is weaker. That's correct. So how is it that the double bond is stronger than the single bond? When a single bond has a sigma bond, and I said the double bond has a pi bond in it, and I said the pi bond was weaker. Now I'm saying the double bond is stronger. What's the obvious answer to that? Does anybody get, know it? There's two of them. There's a sigma bond in here and a pi bond for the double bond. There's just a sigma bond here. So the common mistake is to think, well, you know, a double bond's got a pi bond. You told me pi bonds are weaker. Shouldn't a double bond be weaker? No, it should not. Uh, okay? All right. Finally, single bonds are, as you've seen before, as I said before, um, they're sp3 hybrids, and these guys form tetrahedral angles, as I showed you also before. Whereas the double bonds, double bond of carbons, form a 120-degree uh, angle, and they're all planar. So, check this out. This is kind of crazy. Check this out. Hopefully you can see this. You have these same pictures, but they're colored here. So This is breaking down what a double bond would look like. This is not a double bond. This is not a double bond. These are the two parts of a double bond. Okay. If I've got sp2 hybridization going on, all right, this is an sp2, this is an sp2, this is an sp2 here, and there's also a p available as well that did not get hybridized. So there'll be head-to-head -head overlapping between these two sp2s. That forms a sigma bond right here. There is also those unused p orbitals, which are well, unchanged. I shouldn't say unused. Unchanged p orbitals are not hybridized, and they are forming the pi bond. This is not one pi bond, and this is another pi bond. That whole thing, purple, is the pi bond. This is what the whole thing would look like. The sigma bond here and the pi bond above it. And that is represented in a two-dimensional structure on the board with two lines between it and with a model like this. Okay? That's tough stuff. All right. Here's another way of looking at it. And the last way I'm going to summarize all this stuff. You're going to write a few things in underneath. This is the last page I believe you have there. 
find that page. Okay. Let's summarize all this stuff up one more time. Okay. See, remember how I did this in the beginning? I can, not only can I have two carbons that were going to be C2H6, and then I said, well, I could have C2, C3H8, C4. No, no, keeping the exact same number of carbons. I can have C2H6, C2H4, C2H2 because of the double, single, or triple bonds that can exist between them. So let's summarize this. I know these balloons may be confusing to you, but you got to think of them this way. This is this guy right here, okay? Every one of these carbons has got a tetrahedron around it. Those guys, like one guy's sticking out, this guy's sticking back, this guy's sticking back at angles. It's not on a, you know, it's not all on one plane. C2H6, sp3 hybrid. You can see that, hopefully. He ha he's an sp3 hybrid because he has four bonds. Think about it. sp3. He hybridized one s and three p's. That adds up to four bonds, right? Each carbon's got one, two, three, four things around him, okay? He is four single bonds, and they will form a tetrahedron at 109.5 degree angles, like this one. Got it? Right there. It's hard to show that in Three, a two-dimensional drawing. That's why we use models all the time in organic. You're going to be using them on the computers, in my um, model lab, model kits you're going to be using as well. C2H4. I just went over this guy a second ago, how you put them all together, do this one, same exact one I just talked about. Okay, in a C2H4 guy, if you look at him, if you were to, if you were to see the drawing of him, how many things are bound around this carbon? How many things? One, two, three, right? That makes sense. He would have sp2 hybridization. You see why? 1s, 2ps, three total things. Three total. Okay? Three total bonds, 120 degrees. Planar. That's this guy right here. One plane. He's in. Plane, you know, like geometry plane. Not 747. And finally, C2H2, here's your carbon here. I know it's hard to see it with this one in particular. It's the best graphic I can show because this is the hardest one to show, really. Here's a carbon here, and here's a carbon here, right? If he's SP1 hybrid, he's bound, he's carbon's bound to only two other things. You see why he's only bound to two other things? This is a carbon here, and there's a carbon here, and it's an H. Basically, here's what it would look like if I drew it. It would look like this. Okay? That's what it would look like if I drew it. If I drew this guy, he would look like this. And again, I can't really show the three dimensions yet. I'm going to show you how to draw them. But it would look like that with an H around every one of these guys. Okay? All right. Back to this one. How is this a triple bond? Watch. You have the SP1 hybrid has only two things it's going to be bound to. Here's your one SP1 hybrid right here. Did I change off of this one? No. Yeah. Here's this guy and this guy here. That's your one SP1 hybrid. Here's your other one. Okay. Since you only hybridized one of the P's, where are your other two P's? Right here and right here. They're used to form the two other pi bonds as well as the sigma bond. So that's why it's a triple bond. That's why I would draw it like this. There's a sigma and two other pi bonds in that guy. What kind of a bond is that coming out to this H? What kind of a bond is that, sigma or pi? Sigma. And this one will be sigma as well. All right? It's a sigma based on a sp3 hybrid over there. SP, I'm sorry, sp1 hybrid here, sp1 hybrid there. And one of those sp1 hybrids is right there overlapping head to head. But the other two that form that bond, the other two Ps, are forming two other pi bonds. Wow. That's tough stuff. I know. I see your faces. I hear you. I don't expect you to take a test on this tomorrow. By the way, I'm not quite done with this. Finish that up. Um, two total bonds, 180 degree angle. This stuff is as hard as you would get in 
your chemistry classes in college, including an in organic chemistry. It's not going to get any worse than this. All right? It's conceptual, and, the, and the, here's the nice part about it. Okay, I, I'm teaching you this, and once we get to the macro level, think of it this way. Remember when we first taught you? I first taught you about electrons. I started the atom, the electrons, and all that stuff, right? By the time we were writing compounds, and you knew why is this calcium chloride? If I want to write the formula for calcium chloride. I would write Ca with plus two, Cl with a minus one, CaCl two, right? You never had to go back and think. Okay, calcium's a plus two because uh, he wants to lose two electrons. He's in group two to get an octet. I'm going to draw calcium with two electrons here and chlorine. You know, I originally taught it to you showing the Lewis structures, but did we draw Lewis structures every single time we wrote down a simple compound like sodium chloride or calcium chloride? No, we didn't. So my point is this. Although I'm giving you all this information right now, this bond stuff, once we get past this first couple of days, you're just going to be using it to write stuff like this. You're going to just become second nature, double bond here, triple bond. It, believe it or not, it becomes very, very easy to do. And you never think about whether it's a sigma or a pi anymore. It just doesn't matter. Okay? Or if it's sp3 or sp2 hybridization. Whew. Okay, that's it.